Now, number three, modern medicine has actually done a very good job of addressing. What they haven't done is they haven't explained why people have this problem. The third toxicity is opportunistics. What do I mean by opportunistics? Opportunistics are the bacteria, the virus, the spirochetes, the mycoplasma, the yeast, those types of things. And the reason I call them opportunistics is because they need to have an opportunity they need to have an opportunity to actually affect the body. So if the body's immune system is intact, it's very difficult for these opportunistics to set up house. Why does one person get a cold and another person doesn't? Why does one person get uh, limes and another person doesn't? Why does one person get pneumonia and another person doesn't? Why does one person get the flu and another person doesn't? It's because the, the person that's getting these types of either short or long chronic processes of uh, opportunistic processes, their immune systems have been suppressed. So why has their immune system been suppressed? Because of either one, heavy metals, or two, persistent organic pollutants. So really the first two toxicities help to suppress the immune system that allows for these opportunistic pathologies to set up. If somebody has a very competent and intact immune system, they're not going to be susceptible to getting these problems. Now, if you have a person where everybody's sick and they just never get sick, they never get sick, is that a good sign or a bad sign? Okay, let me, that's a tough question, so let me, let me give you a scenario. And this is a real case scenario. A woman comes into my office. She's pulling an oxygen tank behind her. She's had two bypass surgeries. She's had breast cancer, and she's had uh, uh, basal cell carcinoma of the skin. Um, she's diabetic. She's got uh, a history of myasthenia gravis, and she's on this oxygen that she's breathing through. Oh, and she's also got emphysema. And she's just sitting in front of me in my office, and she tells me her questionnaire, we have a thing called the AHEAD analysis, Advanced Health Evaluation and Assessment for Detoxification. She's filled this questionnaire out, and she has a score that is, the, the, the higher the score, the more toxic the person is. And her score is one-fourth what my score is. And this was like six years ago, and I'm nationally competing in, in athletic events and very healthy, and her score is one-fourth my score. And she says that she has no medical problems. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. She says she never gets sick. She's never been a sick a day in her life. That's what she said. Now, is that person, from the description I just gave you, is that a good sign that she doesn't get sick, or is that a bad sign she doesn't get sick? Her immune system is basically non-existent. That's why she doesn't get sick. When a person gets a fever, that's a good thing. The body is responding. The body is releasing. The white blood cells are releasing interleukin to cause that fever to occur. When the fever gets too high, we try to control it because protein starts denaturing at 105, 106 degrees, so we try to keep the temperature below. But low-grade temperature, when, when patients would come into the emergency room, um, when I did emergency medicine, or even uh, when I did trauma medicine, if you had a post-operative patient that got a you know, temperature of uh, you know, 99, 100 degrees, we didn't freak out about that. That was actually a good thing. The body was responding. Now, of course, you know, they were always concerned that they could be sepsis from the surgery or something, so at 101 degrees, we'd, we'd culture the patient. But generally speaking, low-grade temperature, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a febrile response. It shows the body's immune system's intact. It's responding. That's a good thing. It's when it starts getting to 102, 103 that, you know, people, parents, a lot of times when we give Motrin or, you know, children's Motrin or Tylenol in the emergency room, we're not really doing it for the child. We're really doing it for the parents because they want to have something to control, you know, feel like they're in control. So, you know, one of the things, uh, I, I'll tell you a funny story. We had a, we had a birthday party for my four-year-old just, just about a month ago. Um, Josh, you were there, right? And um, one of my friends was there, and his son, we had this big jumpy, the, what do they call that? The, right. So they were all bouncing around, one of those big bouncers. And, and my friend's son twisted his foot and couldn't walk on it. And um, I was actually taking a shower because I had to get the horse ready for the pony rides and all that other kind of stuff, you know. So I wasn't able to come out right away, but I came out about 10 minutes later. Are you okay? Are you like trying to, like a self-induced lung biopsy? <laughs> um, 
this uh, friend of mine was concerned about his son. His wife is there. I come out, and I said, what happened? They explained to me. And uh, she goes, I think we need to go to the emergency room. And I said, well, if you want to go to the emergency room, that's fine. But my friend, you know, the, the dad, he's a really good friend of mine, he goes, does he need to go to the emergency room? I said, no. Um, she goes, well, don't you think we need to wrap it up? I said, if it'll make you feel better. And she goes, well, you know, doesn't he need an x-ray to make sure it's not broken? I said, no. But if, it, if an x-ray is going to make you feel better, you know, by all means, get it. And I told him, I said, he's going to be up walking in about two minutes. And um, they tried to get him to walk, and he didn't want to walk. And mom was just, you know, very, you could tell she was just really freaking out. So I walked back into the kitchen, and Ernest came with me, and I said, just, just show him some cake or something. He's going to get up and walk. And, you know, it's almost impossible for a four-year-old to break his foot from jumping around, because they're almost all cartilaginous. I mean, I've seen children fall from a two-story building and not break a bone, because they're virtually all cartilage. The, if, if, a child, if a child has a broken bone, the first thing, what do you, what's the first thing you've got to suspect? That's right, exactly right. Because it is tough to break a bone in a child. 